Hello, I am Glenn Hall, and today is April 13th, 2023. This video is called The Wretched, Pitiable, Poor, Blind, and Naked Church. It's part three of my series on Christ's letters to the churches, part three of his letter to the Church of Laodicea. We've covered up through verse 16 of chapter 3. Now we're going to start with verse 17. Well, I'll read 15 and 16. <clears throat> well, even 14, just to remind you of what I've said before. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write the words of the Amen, the words of the truth, the faithful and true witness the beginning of God's creation. I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Verse 17. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. You say that you are rich. In Hosea chapter 12, verses 7, and eight, Hosea says, a merchant in whose hands are false balances, he loves to oppress. In the scripture, the merchant is the Canaanite. The nation of Israel, God called the nation of Israel to displace the Canaanites, to displace their wicked ways. And one of their wicked ways was dealing with false balances cheating people when they made bargains, when they sold to them. Verse 8, Ephraim has said, Ah, but I am rich. I have found wealth for myself. In all my labors they cannot find in me iniquity or sin. Ephraim, the leading tribe of the northern kingdom of Israel, prophetically represents the church. Ephraim became just like the Canaanites, worshiping false gods, practicing false balances in their merchandising of goods and people. So in their doing, they say that they are rich and Ephraim also says, the church also says, I am rich. And in all my labors, they cannot find in me iniquity or sin. Isn't that what the church says? Jesus died for my sins. Therefore, I'm free to sin. Of course, they never call it that. Often they say there is no sin because Jesus put away the law. So there is no sin. <clears throat> the church in Laodicea, just like Ephraim, said, I am rich. I've prospered and I need nothing. I'm rich. I make lots of money with my church. I got money coming in all the time because I, I teach the people they must tithe. They have to support this idolatrous ministry. And Jesus says, you don't realize that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Well, that 
reminds me of Matthew chapter 5, the Beatitudes. Jesus said, verse 3, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, then Jesus, since you say that the Laodiceans are poor, doesn't that mean that theirs is the kingdom of heaven? No, because you say that you're rich. You don't understand that you are poor in spirit. Jesus is talking to people who understand that they're poor in spirit. Do you understand that you're poor in spirit? Do you understand that you can't turn one of your hairs either white or black? I can't change my gray hair into the golden blonde that it used to be. You can't change your black hair into white hair. Going on in the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. And what does that mean? Does that mean mourning over your loss of wealth with the declining stock market? Does that mean mourning over a loved one who just died? No, it means mourning over your poverty of spirit. See, we need to understand that we are poor in spirit. And we need to mourn that we're poor in spirit because we all need more spirit. We all need more of the Holy Spirit. So blessed are the poor in spirit who understand that they are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They're the ones who repent. They're the ones who continue walking with God. And blessed are those who mourn because they understand that they're poor in spirit, because they will be comforted. And blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Without holiness, no one will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You don't realize that you're wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Naked. Hmm. Matthew 22. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered. And everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. He's talking about the Jews and destroying Jerusalem. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. The original ones called were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. The last 2,000 years 
has been going out and calling as many as you can find. But when the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? He thought he had a wedding garment. Laodiceans think they have a wedding garment. Did your church uh, have Easter egg hunt last Sunday on Easter? Then if they did, then know that you go to a Laodicean church. And I could go on and on, but that's just a common, that's just, it's so common. In our local newspaper, their front page in one of the sections was about the Easter egg hunt at First Baptist Church. So people in the church believe that they're clothed with the appropriate garment, but they don't realize that they're naked. And so they think they're going to go to the wedding feast. And the king is going to say, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now in Revelation 3, in the, to the church of Laodicea, the first thing that Jesus says is that I will vomit you out of my mouth. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's go back to the church of Sardis. Verses 3 and 4. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who overcomes will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. To be vomited from the mouth of Jesus is to be blotted from the book of life. That is the warning Jesus gives. And he's warning the people who don't even realize that they're wretched, pitiable, poor. They think they're rich, but they're poor. Blind. That means they do not see spiritual truth. And they're naked. They don't have the wedding garment they will be cast into outer darkness, just as the parable in Matthew 22 said. But Jesus doesn't leave them there. There's still hope, church. There's still hope. But will you hear? Will you repent? So Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. What's that talking about? Well, the Lord just brought to my mind Ezekiel chapter 22. And the word of I am came to me saying, And you son of man, will you judge, will you judge the bloody city? Jerusalem. The church believes that it is New Jerusalem, the bride of 
Christ. But they also are a bloody city. Then declare to her all her abominations. You shall say, Thus says the Lord I am, a city that sheds blood in her midst, so that her time may come, and that makes idols to defile herself. You know your sins. You have become guilty by the blood that you have shed, and defiled by the idols that you have made, and you have brought your days near. The appointed time of your years has come. Therefore, I have made you a reproach to the nations and a mockery to all the countries. Those who are near and those who are far from you will mock you. Your name is defiled. You are full of tumult. Behold, the princes of Israel in you, the princes of the churches, the pastors, the prophets, the apostles, the super apostles, as Paul says, everyone according to his power has been bent on shedding blood. Father and mother are treated with contempt in you. The sojourner suffers extortion in your midst. The fatherless and the widow are wronged in you. You have despised my holy things. You have profaned my Sabbaths. There are men in you who slander, who lie to shed blood, and people in you who eat on the mountains that is, who offer sacrifices to idols. They commit lewdness in your midst, sexual immorality. In you men uncover their father's nakedness. In you they violate women who are unclean in their menstrual impurity. One commits abomination with his neighbor's wife. Another lewdly defiles his daughter-in-law. Another in you violates his sister, his father's daughter. In you they take bribes to shed blood. You take interest and profit and make gain of your neighbors by extortion. But me you have forgotten, declares the Lord I am. Behold, I strike my hand at the dishonest gain that you have made and at the blood that has been in your midst. Can your courage endure or can your hands be strong in the days that I shall deal with you? The days are coming. We are about to enter great tribulation. I am, I, I am, have spoken, and I will do it. I will scatter you among the nations and disperse you through the countries, and I will consume your uncleanness out of you, and you shall be profaned by your own doing in the sight of the nations, and you shall know that I am, I am. And the word of I am came to me. Son of man, the house of Israel has become dross to me. All of them are bronze and tin and iron and lead. In the furnace they are dross of silver. Therefore thus says the Lord I am. Because you have all become dross, therefore behold, I will gather you into the midst of Jerusalem. As one gathers silver and bronze and iron and lead and tin into a furnace to blow the fire on it, In order to melt it, so I will gather you in my anger and in my wrath, and I will put you in and melt you. I will gather you and blow on you with the fire of my wrath, and you shall be melted in the midst of it. As silver is melted in a furnace, so you shall be melted in the midst of it. And you shall know that I am, I am. I have poured out my wrath upon you. The purpose of the wrath is to purify those who will not purify themselves. In the book of Malachi, Malachi also deals with this theme. Chapter 3, Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says, I am a foes. This is talking about Jesus coming to his temple, which is us. The ones who are prepared, who have been prepared, But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. 
He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to I Am. So Jesus is telling the Laodiceans, submit to the refining of my fire. Jeremiah chapter 23 says, Is not my word like fire? Submit to the purification of the word of God. Don't think that you know. Don't think that you're rich. Admit that you're poor in spirit. And then ask God to teach you his word. To refine you by fire. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. Now how how do you buy? How can we buy something from Jesus? I counsel you to buy from me. How do you buy anything? You spend your time earning money so that you can buy what you want. Jesus counsels us to buy from him. You buy the same way. You spend time. You spend your time with Jesus. You spend your time reading his word which is to eat his food. Isaiah 55 says this, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me here that your soul may live. You buy from Christ the same way that you buy from the store. You spend time. You spend time with him. And the way that you do that is by being in his word. Another scripture dealing with that is Proverbs 8. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way, at the crossroads, she takes her stand. Beside the gates in front of the town, at the entrance of the portals, she cries aloud, To you, O men, I call, and my cry is to the children of man. O simple ones, learn prudence. O fools, learn sense. Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips will come what is right, for my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than jewels and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. Now remember in Jesus' parable of the seeds, the third type of seed was choked out by thorns because of the cares of life trying to get rich, making money, spending your time making money for that new car, for that vacation, for those new clothes, for that diamond earring, for that gold necklace. You spend your time for money. You spend your time for gold and silver. And yet wisdom, who is a personification of Jesus, says, take my instruction instead of silver. 
and take my knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom, my wisdom, is better than jewels, and all that you may desire cannot compare with her. Verse 19, my fruit is better than gold, even fine gold, and my yield better than choice silver. I walk in the way of righteousness. I walk in the paths of justice. Granting an inheritance to those who love me and filling their treasuries. Verse 32, and now, O sons, listen to me. Blessed are those who keep my ways. Hear instruction and be wise, and do not neglect it. Blessed is the one who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting beside my doors. For whoever finds me finds life and obtains favor from I am. But he who fails to find me injures himself, and all who hate me love death. So spend your time I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire. Gold is the wisdom of God. We end up with gold within ourselves as we are refined by the fire of God's word. As we apply the word of God to our souls. It's the salvation of our soul. Work out your salvation in fear and trembling. Renew your mind with the word of God. I counsel you to buy for me white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. White garments. Let's go to Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins. At the time of the tribulation, see chapter 25 follows chapter 24, and 24 is filled with Christ talking about what the time of the great tribulation is going to look like. The worst time in history, he says. And if, he did, and if God did not cut the time short, no flesh would be left alive. And then... Chapter 25 follows with three parables. And the first parable is this. The ten virgins. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. And five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. Well, everyone practically on the earth is drowsy and sleeping now and not watching daily for the Lord. But at midnight, there was a cry. The cry has already gone out. It's already past midnight. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough for us and for you, you go, rather, to the dealers and buy for yourselves. Go to the dealers and buy for yourselves. Jesus has been warning the church to buy gold so that they might be rich. It's that gold that becomes the oil that's spoken of here. The oil of the Spirit within us. And that is what gives us our white garments, our fine linen. And while these foolish virgins were going to buy because they waited too late, the bridegroom came 
And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. This is the man who didn't have on a wedding garment in Matthew chapter 22. These foolish virgins, they believed, but they didn't know they were wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. They didn't realize that that they did not have a wedding garment on. They thought they were fully clothed. They were not fully clothed. And then Jesus says, I counsel you to buy salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Can you think of any places in Scripture where salve occurs? How about John chapter 9? As Jesus passed by, he saw a blind man from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. Night is coming. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So the man went and washed, and he came back seeing. So this is the salve that Jesus used to anoint this man's eyes. He spit upon the dust of the ground and made a paste salve and anointed the man's eyes. What does that represent? Remember, all of Scripture is a parable. It all speaks of prophetic reality. His spit is water, which represents the water of the Word. He applied the water of the Word to the earth, to the ground, to the dust of the ground. That symbolically speaks of Jesus applying his word to us. So when he says that we are to anoint our eyes with salve, he's saying you need to wash yourselves in the water of the word. See, the church, they have foot washing ceremonies like they're learning how to be servants to each other is usually how that goes. We need to serve each other. It's not about that, even though to serve each other and to love each other is a great thing. It's about washing yourself with the water of the Word. And so, in all of the this counsel that Jesus gives to the Laodiceans, it's all about applying the Word of God to their lives. They have to wash themselves in the water of the Word. They have to understand that the Word itself is more valuable than gold and silver. It's more valuable than anything that you can earn with money or buy with money. And so just as you have to work, spend your time in order to buy the things you want, you have to work, you have to spend your time 
in order to apply the Word of God to your life. Another parable that deals with this is Matthew chapter 13. Two parables, uh, verse 44. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. So he's using his time, his effort, his money, to buy the treasure that's in that field. It's when we have that treasure of God's word within us that we can get into the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> and then right after that, verses 45 and 46, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. This is what Jesus means to lose your soul in order to gain your soul. You go and you sell all that you have in order to buy the pearl of great price. You sell all that you have in order to buy the land in which the treasure is by which you come into the kingdom of heaven. So that's what Jesus is telling these people. They think they're rich, but they're not because they never did this. They depended, they depended upon a pastor, a prophet, an apostle to tell them what to believe. And they could never discern when that pastor, prophet, teacher, apostle was false. And so they listened to false doctrine their entire lives didn't realize they were sitting at tables covered with vomit, according to Isaiah 28, and eating false doctrine. So then Jesus says, right after he counsels them what to buy, he says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Do you feel reproof? If you haven't been walking in this way, then you should. Jesus reproves and disciplines those whom he loves. So be zealous and repent. Zealous for what? Zealous for the word of God. Zealous for the truth. Zealous for the amen. Zealous for the true and faithful witness. And repent. And you do not know what to repent of unless you know the word of God. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. He's talking about communion. Jesus said that his sheep hear his voice. Do you hear his voice? If you hear his voice, then open the door. Open the door to your heart. That's one thing you have. He who says he doesn't have anything, even what he has, I will take away, Jesus said. You have something. You have the seed of the word of God. Do you hear his voice? Then open the door and Jesus will come in and eat with you. That means communion. You can have communion with God, with Jesus. And then what is the result? It's really the greatest result of all. The one who overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. 
as I also conquered and sat down with my Father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Can two people sit down at the same time on one throne? How can you sit with Jesus upon his throne? How did Jesus sit down with his Father on his throne? Only by identification. I and the Father are one, Jesus said. The goal is that we become one with Christ. And that takes us back to the very beginning of his letter to the Laodiceans when he identifies himself. He says, The words of the Amen, the truth, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. The words of the beginning of God's creation. Oh, wait. Man was created at least 6,000 years ago. What do you mean the beginning of God's creation? Jesus, as a man, as a human being, in flesh and blood, became fully conformed to the image of God. He prevailed, succeeded where no one has ever succeeded before, where he lived a sinless life. And then because of that sinless life, his blood that he shed for his creation, for us, He took to heaven and put in the true mercy seat, covering our sins. Once for all, so that it doesn't have to happen again. will never happen again. Happen one time, for all time, for all creation. But Jesus is the beginning of God's creation. He's he's the beginning of what God intends, what his purpose is for creation, why he did this. He is recreating himself in a finite being, in a in a being that he called man, that he made in his own image. And the purpose of creation was that we would become like him in every respect. Knowing good and evil, but only choosing the good. That's what wisdom is all about. Proverbs 8. Wisdom defines only doing what is good, never doing what is evil, what is selfish. And so his promise to the overcomers of the church of Laodicea is as great as his promise to any of the previous churches. Because what it's talking about is identification with Christ. To the one who overcomes, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne. That's identification. What? Jesus is the king of the kings of the earth. Sit with him on his throne? This is the promise for the overcomer. And it's what the Bible calls glorification. And when your eyes are open to this, 
you will see over and over throughout the scripture that Jesus says, I will be glorified in you. God, in the Old Testament, in fact, says this, I will be glorified in you. So there comes a time when God will glorify the Kodeshim, the Holy Ones, the ones who are prepared, the ones who did this, the ones who bought gold refined by fire, the ones who bought white garments so they could be clothed, the ones who anointed their eyes with salve, with the Word of God. But, Laodicean, are you going to be like the Pharisees in John chapter 9? See, the, John chapter 9, the whole chapter practically is about the Pharisees who just can't, cannot get over this, that this man was healed. Verse 18, the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, is this your son who, was, who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? The parents say, he's of age, ask him. So then the second time they called the man who had been blind, said to him, give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner, talking about Jesus. He answered, whether he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. And they said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I've told you already, and you wouldn't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You're his disciple. We're disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we don't know where he comes from. And the man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Wow. And they answered him, You were born in utter sin and would teach us. And they cast him out just as most churches would cast Jesus out today. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Jesus accepted worship as a man. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. You see, the Laodiceans said they were rich. They said that they saw. And most Christians, most churches say they see. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things and said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, if you really were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say, we see, your guilt remains. <laughs>